Okay, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for this keynote address as part of the 2024 Week of the Peacemaker. Uh, for those of you I don't know, my name is Dr. Sean D'Alfonso. I work as the Director of the Office of Mission and Ministry. Um, and be on behalf of our office and the committee that makes up the Week of the Peacemaker, uh, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for coming to today's event. Uh, just as we begin, I just kindly ask if you have your cell phone, just to kind of uh, tuck it away and just make sure it's on silent so we don't interrupt today's presentation. Um, for over 40 years, Iona University has chosen the time period surrounding Veterans Day to dedicate academic and co-curricular attention to peacemaking and justice. This annual observance and week honors the selfless dedication of veterans for the cause of peace, freedom, and justice. Freedom and justice, excuse me. Each year, our committee determines a theme that's relevant to the current needs of our world, and through a bunch of different programs, we spend a week bringing attention and awareness to this issue and finding opportunities to advocate for it. Since July, myself and a number of other faculty members, staff members, and administrators have spent uh, weeks planning this event, um, and we're very excited that you've taken the opportunity to join us today. As you see on the screen, uh, this year's theme for the 2024 Week of the Peacemaker is Inequality by Design, Unfair Housing, Past, Present, and Future. So this, we're, this year's week, as you can see, will obviously dedicate a lot of attention to housing, uh, shedding light on sort of inequitable practices in the past and still going on today, and finding ways to advocate for solutions for a more just future. So if you haven't seen it uh, in the announcements or on Iona University's Mission and Ministries Instagram, there's a collection of a lot of, of different events, about 12 different events throughout this week. Lectures, documentary screenings, service projects, all types of activities to sort of bring attention to this theme. Today, we have the privilege of introducing and welcoming our keynote speaker for this week of the Peacemaker, Mr. Andrew Lanetta. Instilled with the desire to help people from a young age, Mr. Lanetta found himself drawn to the population of people experiencing homelessness. While attending Lemoyne College from 2008 to 2012, Mr. Lanetta sought out work at homeless shelters and soup kitchens. With curiosity and an open heart, he became friends with many men facing homelessness and began noticing themes in their complex stories. It was while he completed his graduate studies at Syracuse University's Maxwell School that it became extremely apparent there was no safe, respectable, permanent housing solution available for this population. Mr. Lanetta thought that he could do something about it, and in 2014, led by those relationships, he founded an organization, A Tiny Home for Good. This organization dedicated its, dedicates itself to providing safe, affordable, and dignified housing to individuals experiencing homelessness. The organization builds homes and rents them to individuals who are living on the streets at an affordable rate and connects them with case management and provides additional support to encourage long-term stability. Mr. Lanetta oversees the day-to-day -day operations and directs the organization's exciting growth. So at this time, please give a warm Iona welcome to the founder and executive director of A Tiny Home for Good, Mr. Andrew Lanetta. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. Um, I think I want to start with what I'm not going to do here today. I, I most certainly don't have the answer to the housing crisis. I'm not here to give that. Okay? I don't know enough. I don't have the chops to talk about um, gerrymandering or red line or inequities in mortgage lending. I simply don't. What I hope to do today is encourage and maybe inspire just a little bit when you look into this week of Peacemaker, how you can think about it not as much as observing what's going on, but how you can actually be an active part of what's happening. I looked at the agenda, man. You guys got a lot on this week, and I think thinking about yourself as actors in this is really important. So before I jump into it, um, no, we're good, we're good. Um, I want to kind of point out my North Star, okay? So this is the Oxford Street Inn more colloquially and formally, intimately known as the Ox, okay? It is known for the last 40 years in the city of Syracuse as the last place on the, on the block, all right? So why is that? It welcomes anyone in any condition, okay? If someone is drunk, if they're high, if they're on their meds, if they're off their meds, if they just got into a fight, it didn't matter. This place welcomed them. And in 2008, after a bunch of starts and stops, I ended up at Lemoyne College and somehow found my way falling in love with this place. 
And I have the ability of retrospect now to kind of look at why. And in my mind, this place, the Oxford Street Inn, was the most direct example of action I had ever seen in my entire life. There were two guys who called themselves Catholic workers that back in the 70s were sick and tired of seeing individuals facing homelessness freeze to death in abandoned Syracuse houses. So they opened up what really was just a warehouse, barely could keep it at 60 degrees because of the shitty furnace, and opened it up to guys facing homelessness. I was so taken by that because, as I said, it was the most direct form of action I had ever seen in my life to date. So, with that as like my North Star, I have to give a nod to that place because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. I kind of want to talk about our agenda for the next 40 minutes, half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, first, quick about me, and then about the organization that I founded back in 2014, A Tiny Home for Good. I then want to get into observation and action, and really the problem with too much in either direction. Next, the real secret weapon, and finally, putting it all together, I'll then at the end open it up for a couple questions. I went to school outside of Boston. Um, the school I went to had a pretty much 99% graduation rate. Of those 99%, 98% ended up at college. I thought that's what I wanted to do. I applied to a bunch of different schools, got rejected from every single one. I was not, good at, not a good student. I was a terrible test taker, and my grades and my test scores reflected that. So upon reflection, I thought about, okay, what's, what's next? My mom's been a special education teacher her whole life. I thought that's what I wanted to do. So, I went and did an AmeriCorps program called City Year. City Year is a program where it puts young people into inner city schools and invites them to be assistant teachers, after school program leaders, and just really helping the administration there. I was placed in Cleveland, Ohio, and I learned two things super quickly. Number one is I had no idea how to take care of myself. This was the first time that really I was on my own. Thank God I had two parents who cared deeply for me, so I didn't have to take care of things. But I remember the very first month I was there, um, I had to pay rent, right? I had managed to find this house before Craigslist turned into a big old dumpster fire. I found a house um, on the east side of the city with four seniors from John Carroll University. And the first month I was there, one of the guys came up to me and said, hey, this is how we pay rent, okay? One guy covers the whole rent for the whole house one time, and then in five months, you got to do the same thing again. I, being this like naive 16-year-old, was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. So cut this check for $2,000, which was almost every penny I had, sent it to the management company, and thankfully, a couple days later, they sent it back, indicating that no, my rent was only $400, and also letting me know that I forgot to sign the check. I had so many experiences like that in Cleveland, which, if I'm being honest, made my transition to college a piece of cake. The other thing I learned was that I was not cut out to be a special education teacher, or a teacher for that matter. I saw the teachers that I was kind of assisting day in, day out, goddamn heroes. I could not do that every single day. So I had to kind of go back to the drawing board. So I reapplied to a bunch of schools. Thankfully, Lemoyne in Syracuse, New York, was excited by like, the year I did abroad, excuse me, the gap year I took, and took me. And I started thinking about what I really wanted to do when I was at college, right? what was really interesting to me. And I started thinking a lot about international development. Um, my great aunt is a nun. She served in Lima, Peru for 40 years. We spent some summers down visiting her. I was floored at that work. I started thinking maybe that's what I wanted to do. So through kind of freshman and sophomore year, I started exploring ways that I could get involved, maybe with immigration issues or Spanish or something. I ended up spending my junior year in Mexico um, working right on the border of Arizona and Mexico um, in Nogales, serving on a soup kitchen run by Jesuits, just learning more and more about what's going on in the immigration crisis. I thought that's what I wanted to do. However, I was tugged towards a totally different direction. If I showed you, I showed you that picture of the Oxford Street Inn from way back in the day. I was tugged towards that. My first day at Lemoyne, I remember there was a sandwich making program where they were bringing sandwiches down to the Oxford Street Inn. I walked into there and I couldn't leave. So despite wanting to feel tugged towards Peru or tugged towards Mexico, every time I came back to Syracuse, I found myself working and spending more time at the Ox. I started going down on there on a regular basis, started running writing groups there. A friend of mine wanted to start a Bible study, so I helped him start this Bible study. And before I knew it, they offered me a job there. 
at the time, I was super proud. I was really happy for it. In retrospect, I was just a warm body, and they needed someone to be a shelter aide there. So when I was a junior, I started working at the Ox and uh, learned, learned so much. One of our jobs was at 7 a.m. It was a night shelter, right? So guys come in at 5 p.m. At, at 7 a.m., we kick them out. One of my roles was at 7 a.m., kicking guys out the door. Didn't matter what the weather was. It didn't matter if it was, you know, 30 degrees out, if it was 10 degrees out, if the person was in a walker, their ass had to go. And that drove me crazy, right? I couldn't stand that this was a problem that no one was solving. We just let these guys go out into the wilderness and, you know, through with their addictions, mental health challenges, and just expected that maybe at 5 p.m. they'd come back. So I started talking to a community center around the corner, asked them if we could invite guys in to start just spending time there during the day, almost as like a warming place in the winter. Community center was super open to it. They were looking for more life to happen there, and they welcomed me to just open the door for, you know, games, whatever. So guys would go from the shelter to this community center. However, as the weather got nicer, no one wanted to just sit inside and play Connect Four or anything. They were looking for more exciting things to do, and I totally get that. Time I fell in love with a bicycle, all right? And the guys at the shelter had a pretty unique um, relationship with the bicycle, similar to me. They're not gonna have a car. Their only form of transportation was the bike. So started inviting people to join group bike rides. Every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'd go on a bike ride, and that's all it was, just a group bike ride. But after a little while, it turned into something. A friend of mine there decided to call it something, called it Pedal of Possibilities, and after 10 rides, the participant got to keep the bike. Simple as that, and it just kept on going, kept on going. And I think that there were a bunch of incredible things about that particular program. Uh, form of transportation for individuals who desperately need transportation, healthy activity, but here's the most important part, the most important. When you look at that picture down there of those riders, you'd be hard pressed to tell who slept in the shelter the night before and who actually drove their bicycle in on the back of their car and went on the bike ride. Everyone was kind of the same when they were on the bike. And that was really special because all of a sudden we were having conversations with people who may have just been sleeping in, under the bridge the night before and really trying to dive into what that problem was. Very different than a soup kitchen where it's super clear who's being served and who's not. It was around this time, finished up at Le Moyne College, and started thinking about what I you know, really want to do. I was still running Pedal to Possibilities, still at the Oxford Street Inn. And I started recognizing that the same guys were constantly coming in looking for a bed, just over and over again. This was by no means a permanent housing solution. This was supposed to be a temporary solution, emergency shelter. And I started trying to figure out, like, why exactly was this? Why did they get out of the shelter to permanent housing and then in a matter of months, usually weeks, come back looking for a bed? And the truth is I started blaming the guys, started thinking that they just couldn't, you know, pay their own rent, or they wanted to be closer to the drugs and the alcohol. And then I went and visited one of these places, not intentionally. Um, Barry, tenant at the shelter, excuse me, a, a resident at the shelter, called me one night, said he found a cheap apartment downtown, was hoping that I could take him there. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So he threw his belongings into my truck, drove to this apartment, and I kid you not, you could smell this place, okay, before you got there. 12 feet away, you could smell what was just decades of decay, mold, urine, tons of people. Walk up this stairs, which is half of them are broken, right? You can barely see anything. Walk down a hallway to Barry's room. It's just a room. And all it is is a tiny 100 square foot space with a dresser with no drawers and a saggy mattress. I asked Barry, like, okay, here, here you go. Dropped his stuff. Just literally dropped his stuff there. He's sharing a bathroom with another 15 guys. Dropped his stuff. He calls me four hours later and says he wants to go back to the shelter. And immediately I'm thinking like, all right, I get it. I wouldn't want to live in that location either. I started thinking that what's affordable, what is within the price range of individuals facing homelessness, does nothing to sustain any long-term stability. So I started asking. Right? I started asking service providers, housing providers, case managers, why the hell we can't get someone into a place that they want to stay in for a long time? And the answer is kind of on its head pretty sobering, and one that if you really internalize it, it's hard for one person to beat. So I think there's two things. Income does not incentivize development or maintenance. Barry was paying $400 a month for that room if he had stayed there. It sounds like a lot. 
Truth is, though, that that combined with the cost to maintain that building, combined with the cost of taxes and insurance, makes it not at all intriguing for the owner and developer to actually fix the place, right? He doesn't care as long as he gets his $400, he's gonna let that thing keep on going to, to waste. Now, if that was someone paying market rate in that particular place, they would fix it in a heartbeat. They wouldn't have rats running all over the place. The incentive is not there financially. But there's something that's, I think, in my mind, a little bit, um, uh, a little bit sadder. Not-for-profit development has historically looked like buildings like that right there. And in Syracuse, that is straight up not necessary. I'll explain that in a bit. But that is a building in which 60% of those 360 units are men, women, or families that directly came from the shelter and were told this is the only option. As you can imagine, it is rough in there. And that has, it's called the skyline. It was recently condemned. That is unfortunately how not-for-profit development has happened for decades. Housing that does as cheap as possible to pound as many people into a place as possible, get them out of the shelter, keep on moving, keep on moving, hope for the best. So when faced with those issues, I started asking guys what they're looking for. And no one explained that they wanted that apartment complex before. They all said the same thing. They all said they wanted their own bedroom, their own bathroom, and a key, right? A key that when they lock their door in the morning, they knew that their stuff would still be in there, there in the evening. In my mind, nothing profound. Nothing that every single one of us doesn't deserve. So I started thinking more on this, started thinking more on this. I started thinking they were really describing like a tiny home. They were describing a small space that's their own, their own four walls where they don't have to deal with other people facing similar alcohol addiction issues or mental health challenges. They were describing a tiny home that was just theirs. Now, I know many of you may not be familiar with kind of the Syracuse landscape, but due to a massive depopulation in the 80s and 90s, there is so much vacant land, very similar to that parcel right there. You can go down an entire neighborhood and see more vacant land in abandoned homes than you can see occupied homes. And that's bad, that is bad for the city, but it also is a terrific opportunity to build homes that actually make sense for individuals facing homelessness. We are, have the luxury in Syracuse to not build those massive apartment complexes that we historically have. So I thought, why aren't we doing that? And I talked with a bunch of different service providers, asked them if we could incorporate that into their mission, asked if they'd be interested in doing it, and I was hit with that second bullet point. It is not cost effective to build in this manner. Well, thankfully, we sat down, myself and a small board of directors, and we founded a tiny home for good in 2014. So we got this organization, right? I'm slowly raising money, speaking to literally whoever will hear me. It might be a church, a community club, someone, wh whatever. I didn't care. I just wanted to share about what we were doing. And after about six months, we were able to raise enough money to build the first two houses. Now we just had to figure out where to build them. As I said before, there was tracks of vacant land available. Both the city and the county identified multiple pieces of land they wanted to give to us, provided we go and get neighborhood approval. You can you guys can probably imagine how this is gonna go. I remember when I was still in this, I bounded up on a neighbor's porch just to share with them about this idea. I said, look, we're gonna rehab this land. They were with me, they were with me. We're gonna put tiny homes on it, they were with me, and we're gonna rent them to individuals facing homelessness. Went south immediately. We had multiple community meetings where we were trying to share what we were doing, and I remember one guy looked me square in the eye, said directly to me, loud enough so everyone can hear, if you build this next to me, I'm going to burn it down. So I feel like I was kind of, this was three years of meetings like this, trying to figure out if this thing would work. And I'm going to be honest, I was super close to calling it quits, like multiple times. I almost applied to be an aide for a New York State Congresswoman. I was offered a job running the Housing and Homeless Coalition, which is a small consortium of not-for-profits in the city. Um, and I almost just hopped on my bike and went. Right after graduating from Le Moyne, my girlfriend and I at the time biked across the country. It was the most special 63 days that I'd had to date, but it didn't solve this answer. So. Those things were all running through my mind. About to pull the trigger on every single one of them except continue tiny homes. Then I met Dolphus. Dolphus is our very first tenant that joined us in 2016. And I met Dolphus at the shelter a cold February night when he came in freezing on his bicycle. 
icicles all the way down to about his, down to his chin, freezing, crying, indicating that he wasn't allowed to stay at the rescue mission because he got into trouble over there, came over to the Oxford Street Inn, they took him in for the night, but because he had some other altercations, he wasn't allowed to stay there. I thought, if we don't see a tiny home for good through, Dolphus will unfortunately face what's the fate of most individuals facing chronic homelessness is, which is a life expectancy of 52 years. So forged by Dolphus and those relationships, I decided to keep doubling down. And in 2016, I met with every single landlord in the city who owned vacant land. Every single one, like I, I kid you not, knocked on so many doors, asking if we could just buy a piece of land from them. And lo and behold, there was a woman who owned a piece of land on the south side of the city, sold it to us for $2,000, and we hit the ground running. So in 2016, after three years of pushing, 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 we had our first two pieces of property, and Dolphus moved in. Since that point, we've kind of gone on like gangbusters. People have seen our success, county has seen our work, city has seen our work, and we've grown. And the best way that I can kind of describe our work is in three things. We are a builder, we're a landlord, and we provide case management. First and foremost, we build the houses, right? Like most of our properties are brand new construction tiny homes, about 400 square feet each. Everyone's given their own bedroom, their own bathroom, kitchen, comes completely furnished. But those things don't just pop into the ground, right? We on staff per have the general liability to be building these homes. Um, we have construction managers on staff that help make these things happen. And we do now a mix of both rehabs and new construction. As I mentioned earlier, the city has a bunch of abandoned properties. Most should be torn down, some not so much. We do our best to put those back together as well. The other piece that I think um, often gets overlooked is that we're the landlord. So tenants sign a year-long lease with us. They're expected to pay rent based on their income. We're typically collecting about $300 per month per unit. But when we sign that piece of paper, we have real obligations to those tenants and to those properties. So that means that we mow the lawn, that means we take care of sewer issues when they happen, that means that we are there to be that not out of town landlord that all of our tenants have become so used to. And the last thing, the only reason why this all works though is because of this last component. As much as I hoped that a tenant would move in and those four walls would do the job, it's not. A tenant doesn't come into our house and immediately their alcohol addiction disappears, or immediately they're able to figure out how to get their meds. No, it takes long-term care management support to do this. And we have care managers on staff that are there for every single tenant who calls a tiny home for good their home. Now, I think that there's three main reasons why this works. Um, and the first, and I think most important, is the fact that we are what's called scattered site housing. We don't have all of our units in one place. We are in neighborhoods all over the city. The same guy who told me he was gonna burn our houses down, I now invite with me to talk at community meetings. Because he says the same thing every single time. He says, it's not what you think. And that is so profound. Like as soon as you say the word homeless, everyone immediately assumes a shelter. Everyone assumes that apartment complex. I think the reason why we are successful is the fact that our units are spread out everywhere. It's not what people think of when they think of homeless housing. And the second non-negotiable thing is that it's permanent. There are a lot, like a scary amount of opportunities for individuals facing homelessness to find transitional housing, right? They can get out of the shelter for six months to a year, be somewhere, but guess what? Now they gotta go search the private market for a place to live. No, as long as I'm the director of a tiny home for good, our housing is going to be permanent. And not only will they you know, be able to be there for as long as it suits them, they'll have case management that's with them for the entire time. I think those are two non-negotiables that are the reason why our tenants have succeeded to date. And I think the last thing, before I get into a little bit deeper observation and action, is why it works for me. And I sometimes think it's kind of cheap for a speaker to throw in a quote from someone else, but this one just nails it so on top of the head. Theologian Frederick Buchner said, the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Now, I honestly could not think of a place that that's more applicable than for me at a tiny home for good. 
And I know that's a hard place to be, and I know that getting there takes a long, long time, and I know that I'm probably going to find something in 10 years that's very different. But this is why a tiny home for good works for me right now. So I want to dive into observation and action. Um, maybe because I was preparing for this talk and this lunch was fresh on my mind, but a month ago I was contacted by someone who said, hey, my friend loves what you do, she wants to meet you. As the director of an organization that's constantly trying to raise the funds, those are calls that I have to take. So we went out got to get lunch. After the, like, the perfunctory introductions, she brings up a question that I had never thought of before. She goes, Andrew, what, what happens in 30 years when there's no one around to build your houses? I'm like scratching my head. I was like, what do you, um, I, uh, and so as I'm thinking of a response, <laughs> she goes, there is an epidemic of inner city kids who don't know how to use power tools. It's like, whoa, okay. Um, and I'm starting to think of a couple different like resources to send her away. And she's like, and that epidemic is fueled because the kids don't have parents who are active in their lives pushing them towards active things. She was like, what you do is good, what you do is great, what you do is a Band-Aid. And at this point, I'm feeling a little like, huh, all right, not cool. And she's like, what you need to do is address the family structure if you want to end homelessness. At this point, I'm just like, what the hell? Is Hold on. Like, so, so for another hour, she kind of preaches at me about how what a tiny home for good is doing is okay, but really, if I wanted to end homelessness, I would figure out how to keep families together. So I leave that meeting thinking like this, okay, whatever, that, that's, that's, that's just a meeting. I'm going to put that in the rear view. But then I think a little bit more. I'm like, eh, maybe she's right, right? And I start thinking, okay, well, if I had, you know, I've never met someone facing homelessness who's had both parents active in their lives, right? That is just almost a prerequisite. But what if I really kind of got to the root of this? So what if we, like, played out this exercise? Tiny Home for Good decide to start a, you know, little, I don't know, after-school program to teach kids how to use power tools, right? Then I start learning that, okay, well, they're uh, not showing up to school because their parents aren't encouraging them to come to school. So I go and find out that, oh, guess what? Their parents, one of them is in jail. And actually, a quarter of our participants, their parents are in jail. It's like, okay, how do I combat that? Well, I guess I got to take down the, the, the structure that this country is founded on, the, like the structural racism that this country is founded on. That's what I have to go and attack. So I start doing that. And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, in a thousand years, is this world going to be here because of climate change? Right? You start going down this path when you observe and start thinking a little bit too much, and the end result is always the same. The end result is always what's even the point. And I got to be honest, guys. That is the most concerning question that anyone who cares about this world can make. That stinks of apathy. That stinks of what. And we don't need people like that. Frankly, what we need in this world is actors, not observers, not people who follow the observations to the most saddest conclusion. So that's when too much observation, right? What if you swing the pendulum in the other direction, right? What if you're like, okay, he's saying I shouldn't think about a thing. I should just go and act, just put my head down and just act. But what if you did that? I think I unfortunately have a little bit of that in me. And I have countless experiences of when I've kind of gotten myself into trouble because I haven't thought too much. Probably the biggest is only two years into our organization actually a little bit longer than that, only two years into owning property. We had just finished those first two houses. We got a little press. Um, powers that be from Cooperstown, New York, some elected officials came down to see what we did. Um, they were impressed. They liked it. They invited me to come out to Cooperstown to come and share about a tiny home for good. Like, Great. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm the executive director. I got to share about what I do. I get back from that, that conversation. There is an email in my inbox offering a contract for a tiny home for good to go to Cooperstown, New York, to build 16 of these houses and manage them long term. I'm thrilled. I'm like, this is, wow, this is exactly it. I sign the paper, sign the dotted line, I print, sign, scan, send it back to the powers that be at Otsego County. Now, I made a bunch of mishaps right there. First and foremost is I don't have the legal authority to do that. 
as a not-for-profit, we are governed by a board of directors. A board of directors has to approve signing the contracts with other entities. So I went above and beyond and did that. We had a board meeting a week later. I kind of soft-pitched this idea to our board, not telling them that I had signed that contract yet. They had so many great answers for why we should not be a part of this. From like, Andrew, it's just you. It's two and a half hours away. Do you even know how to build a house yet? All of these were incredibly legitimate questions. All of them drove me crazy, though. I remember that board meeting being a mix of scared, like I had this feeling in the pit of my stomach because I had already signed that paperwork, and also so infuriated that I had someone telling me I had to like slow down. So thankfully, with I, uh, retrospect, I still have my job. We were able to get out of it because I went to my board chair and I said, Sarah, I got some bad news. Uh, already signed this. And thank goodness she didn't take this in a very different direction. She said, okay, let's go get out of it. Sure enough, we were able to get out of that contract. But I learned quick, 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 quick. That unlike too much observation that can just lead to apathy and like whatever, someone you do really just don't want to be around, too much action can lead to real, real damage. It can lead to expensive mistakes, and it can lead to potentially organizational ending problems. So, I think we can all agree on this, right? This is not rocket science, right? You didn't need me to come from Syracuse to tell you that we need both action and observation simultaneously. What I think there isn't enough clarity on, though, is the ratio is the ratio of action to observation. I'm gonna argue that that's not what we typically see. I think most people are skewed the other way, where they observe and think somebody else is gonna handle the problem. Well, I'm gonna be honest, I think what we need is more action. I think any good thing that has come out of this world is because of action. I know that if I just observed the problem, thought about Dolphus, just kept thinking, all right, well, what's even the point? he wouldn't have a home anymore. I can say that about every single one of our tenants. So it's action, I think it really kind of tips the tide towards positivity. Now, I think this is a super important slide, and if you're gonna take anything away from what I'm talking about today, it's this. It is that action takes many forms, okay? For me, I love construction, right? I love building, I love building an organization, I love having my tool belt on. I am terrible at financial management, okay? I'm not detail-oriented. I, I make a purchase at Home Depot, I got the receipt, it's gone before I even like, know what the heck happened. My office manager is constantly calling different vendors that we pay because they have to track down purchases that I make. I say that because there's people whose skill set is detail-oriented financial management. There's people whose skill set is law. There's people whose skill set is communications and grant writing. Those are instrumental in doing good in this world. So my point is that you don't have to go build a house for someone, or you don't have to serve food, or you don't have to take in a stray puppy. It's doing what feels right to you and using that to make this world a better place. Now, kind of getting towards the end before questions, but I think the last thing to talk about, um, and this is something that I'm still really kind of wrapping my head around, is how important consistency is. Okay, so you can act, you can have the most profound action for someone, and it won't matter unless you're consistent. I'm gonna share, as you probably can tell, the story of William. William moved in with us in 2018, okay, pretty early in our time. I remember he moved in, we signed lease, he didn't even look at me, no eye contact, zero, zero. It was his caseworker, myself, and him in the unit. We left, the caseworker kind of shouts behind his shoulder, see you later, Iceman. I'm like, okay, what is that? So we're walking down the stairs, and I asked the caseworker, like, why Iceman? And the case manager looks at me, and he's like, that dude is cold. It's like, oh, okay. So two things immediately. We no longer called William Iceman. That's crazy for a psyche. Like, like <laughs> calling a guy Iceman just because he doesn't want to talk to you, that's nuts. Second is we settled in. We started knocking on William's door regularly. We started inviting him to the events that we host. Started inviting him to coffee. For two years, he would have none of it. For two years, we might get in there to do the routine inspections that are required to do, but that was it. 
Very little eye contact, very little talking. And probably three years in, I'm driving past his house, and I see some potted tomato plants. I'm thinking maybe a donor dropped off a bunch of plants to all of our tenants, because William sure as hell is not planting tomatoes. So keep going. I find out later that month that not only is William planting tomatoes, he also has a cat now. I'm like, who the hell is this guy, right? And we're continuing to do the nudges, continuing to talk to him, continuing to be a part of his life. Fast forward to one year ago. My case manager says she wants to host a walking group. Sure, do it. So every Tuesday at 10 a.m., we do a walking group, two miles around the city, stopping at all of our different houses, or as many as we can. I remember the very first one, it was a cold, cold day. We went, we had a pretty good turnout, and my case manager got up to William's house. I would have bet my truck that this dude wouldn't join the walk. I would have lost my truck. He came out super excited to join the walk and walked. He still wouldn't really like spend too much time talking to anyone that originally, but then with each progressive week, he joined every single walk. He started coming out to more activities. All of a sudden, there's this person who I didn't realize was our tenant yet. It was absolutely beautiful, and I can cognitive, I can confidently say it wasn't the action of giving William a house. It was not. It was the action of over and over and over again checking in with him. I have hundreds of stories like that, but that one is without a doubt the most special. Problem is, is that consistency for a college student, you don't necessarily have that luxury of a decade of action with one person or one cause. And in my mind, it's almost counterintuitive, okay? I think consistency for a college student isn't so much about finding something and doing that same thing over and over. It's kind of listening to what that tug is and following that. This is a picture of me junior year. I think I'm like 12. I, like junior year in Mexico, is, um, I was helping to teach an English class. It was my very last day there. It was an incredible, I remember it clearly. I also bet if you asked Andrew right after that picture was taken, what was I going to do with the rest of my life, I probably would have said immigration issues. Look, man, fast forward just a couple months, I was like starting Pedal the Possibilities, so excited about the ox. My encouragement for you is when you consider consistency as a college student, it's not thinking that you got one path you got to take. It's being very open to the different paths that are out there, because trust me, there are so many. So, I think in my mind, putting it all together, first and foremost, action. Action, action, action. Like, none of what we've just discussed, none of the people who you admire, none of the causes you admire would exist. It would exist if it was not for action. Number two, consistency. And number three, you gotta have that splash of observation or else, look, what have we been doing? I have one last thing to say. Um, before I turn it over to questions. Uh, Mid-pandemic, we started getting this regular donation, sizable donation from this guy. I reached out to him over email, said like, hey, thanks so much, maybe we can get coffee or something. And uh, crickets, didn't hear a thing. But those donations kept on coming. Donations kept on coming. Clear pandemic, like a couple times later, I was like, hey, Jeff, I would love to get you coffee. Like, just to hear about you, duh, 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 like, wanna hear why you care about our work. He sends me a super short email. I have 15 minutes on Tuesday, 8 a.m., Salt City Coffee. <laughs> All right, guess we're doing this. So I show up there, he's already sitting down. Um, he kind of like, just like presents the seat. It's like, here you go. It's like, All right, so I sit down. He's like, I don't want to waste your time. What you're doing is exactly what you should be doing. You have to do more of it. And he grabs me by the shoulders and he just looks at me and he says, keep going. He's like, that's it. It's like, okay, <laughs> right, so I got up and left. Every time I see him now, whether it be at the coffee shop or at our last fundraiser, he grabs me by the shoulder and says, keep going. So I'm not gonna grab every single one of you by the shoulder. That's, that's crazy. But what I am gonna do is just do my best metaphorical grab of the shoulder to encourage you to really, really think about this next week here, week of the peacemaker, and think about how you can act on it, right? How you can dive right into it and keep, keep going. Cool, thanks guys, so appreciate it. I'll open up to questions for a little bit. Thank you, Andrew. Let's hope this mic hangs on here. But uh, do we have questions for Andrew? All set? 
Hi, Andrew. Thank you. Um, Linda Nepacek with George. I'm actually Associate Director at the Heinz Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Um, and we're taking the take on social entrepreneurship. And part of the things that I teach my students is this idea of, you know, you're running a business and I know you're, you're, you're getting funds, but how do you run the business, right? Because the funds are to build the homes but you still need funds to run the business. How are you making money? Yep, damn right. You absolutely have to run a business. And I think that I, my, my best answer to that is that I have an incredibly intelligent, competent board of directors that helps me to do that. So I have started building a team around me that has those business-minded skills that, I'm gonna be honest, that's not me. That's just not me. But in the day-to-day, -day, in the tangible, we have specific grants that are set aside for construction that we touch whenever we spend money at Home Depot whenever I pay a subcontractor. And then I am out hustling so that our staff can get paid, asking, unfortunately, many of the same people for money, utilizing our tenant rent to kind of give back to the organization to make sure we can keep chipping away. I will be honest, as we've grown and I've started seeing donations from people who I don't know, like I'm recognizing that the power of really getting our word out there. Um, so our overhead is covered by getting our word out there, frankly. Um, thankfully, our, much of our construction dollars are covered by grants by the county and the city, though. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think it what I, I kind of glanced over that, having a CPA, a certified public accountant, on our board who double checks our financials, triple checks our financials, and makes sure that they're exactly where they have to be, I wish I had done that so much longer ago. It was really me just pulling our QuickBooks for the first three years and just like, throwing them at the wall hoping they stuck. So it was having someone with that professionalism to be able to check that that's been really instrumental. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Andrew. Kev Kevin Griffith, Christian brother here at Iona. I work for uh, community partnerships and service learning. Uh, my question for you is uh, throughout the course of your work and still at the present time, how do you deal with rejection, because I'm sure there's a lot of that. And what advice do you have for the, our students about how they could deal with rejection when they have an interest in starting something like you've done? It's a really good question. I think I wouldn't, I would not quit when it's hard. So I know that that's, that's a hard, that's a tricky thing to say. But I would quit only if, like, <laughs> I did a lot of bike touring when I was younger, like biked across the country, did tons of bike riding. Some, a, a piece of that that I take away from me now is that I never want to quit on the hard days, okay? I want to quit on a day, if I'm going to quit, when I'm clear-minded, clear minded, then I'm making a decision because I'm able to say X, Y, and Z does not make sense for me. So. If you're facing rejection, if you're over and over facing rejection, things just aren't making sense to you, I would do your very best to consider those options and make sure that that decision isn't based on just because you don't want to put your foot down and keep working. It's based on a real, tangible reason that's not going to happen. Because look, if it's just grit, if it's just putting your foot down and going, like, you got to keep going. Um, the other piece that I would say is that having a small group of advisors, not huge. You don't want to put your problems out on Facebook and ask for people to come and provide insight there. But having a couple people, a mentor, a family member, significant other, who's offering you feedback is so, so important. Um, so those two things, not making a decision based on emotion, basing it on facts, and also having a group of people close to you who can advise are the things that at least I really benefited from. Hi, um, I was just wondering like obviously you have like limited amount of tiny houses and like there's a lot of people like facing like homelessness like how do you like choose I guess who you put into these houses and who you let stay in the shelter until you have more houses like what's your vetting process I guess. We, uh, we utilize what's called the coordinated entry system. The county does a really good job of counting who's facing homelessness. They don't do a great job of housing them, but they have a really good job of keeping track of who is homeless and what kind of co-occurring mental health or addiction issues they have. 
they then really rank them based on who's been homeless the longest with who really needs the housing. We typically pull from the top of that list when we have a vacancy. Um, there might be the occasional time when we have like a real dire situation that the person might be low on the list and we gotta get them in, but it's really, really nice for us to be able to identify that list as our answer. I think the bigger question though is how do we get more of what we're doing? And I don't think it's only a tiny home for good building tiny homes. It's, real, it's my real hope that other affordable developers in Syracuse can look at our model, look at scattered sites, smaller, quality over quantity and recognize that as a permanent solution. And that's, that's, I just hope that the more we do, the more people recognize that it's working and the more other people will dive into it. That answer your question? Okay. Okay, so first one, um, light bulb moment was that interaction I had with Barry when I went and dropped him off for the first time at that shitty, shitty apartment and realized this is what the private market can offer someone like Barry. There was that. Second, um, your question is what, what, like best. Yeah, I had no idea just how much I would love construction, right? Like I set this up thinking we were gonna sub out everything. We were gonna raise the money, give the plans to a builder and they'd go and do it. Found out instantly that we can't afford to do that. So we started building on our own and I fell in love with that process. It is a very happy accident that I think happens when you start doing things that are tugged in the right direction, you're gonna start having these other interests that just kind of fit naturally. Um, so there's that. And then the third piece, the hardest, is evictions. Like we on occasion have to ask tenants to leave. Now, I can safely say that uh, we try everything before we do that. We try absolutely everything from trying to hook them up with other case management, from trying to put them with payee systems, from literally moving them to other locations. But that is the hardest part of the work, um, is dealing with the individuals who are really trying to help when they don't necessarily want to help themselves as much as we want to help them. And I think that's just the nature of working with mental health challenge and addiction issues. I just think it is. And uh, it still doesn't make it any easier, though. I have a question for you. You, on one of your slides, uh, you had the letters NIMBY on there, and I'm not sure if everyone knows what that means, but you know, I think obviously the work of a tiny home for good is changing the physical sort of outcome of, of people's lives and things like that, getting them off the streets. How has the organization sort of combated stereotypes like fighting NIMBYism and maybe stereotypes about people experiencing homelessness? Sure, sure. NIMBY, sorry I didn't explain it, the acronym's not in my backyard. Um, I think that the, our actual model, I, I, I just touched on it briefly, but the fact that it's scattered site, the fact that we never have more than six individuals in a location is so crucial, so, so crucial. Um, and Syracuse, as I kind of alluded to, has the luxury of being able to spread out some of these homeless issues around the city. I understand maybe a place like New Rochelle, like there's a vacant piece of land, that thing is gonna be gobbled up in a heartbeat, right? There's gonna be tons of activity wanting to do that. But for us, it's the scattered site model that has really been effective there. And having some, um, I guess, credible messengers who will come with me to these meetings and say, I'm a neighbor of these tiny homes and not a big deal, not a big deal. So knowing who the neighbors are and just our model in general um, is what, how we've kind of combated NIMBYism to date. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? Okay, please give Andrew one, oh, one more question. Hold on, before we give that last hand, there you go. Uh, so in, in, how would you envision sort of your model being replicated? Because like you just mentioned, in a place on New Rochelle and urban settings, this is not very, you know, you can't replicate it, right, as, as easy. But the solution is there and, and you have something, right? Like yeah. you have something. Um, I, I see it being replicated in not an urban area, but a lot of the times it's needed in the urban areas. I think, th I don't necessarily think that tiny homes or even that model of housing is what needs to be replicated. I think the permanency and I think the long-term case management can be replicated anywhere. Like, tiny home, it's important to our growth, it's important to who we are, but I don't think I say enough that it's the case management and permanency of our houses. And I'm afraid that there is a lot of funding out there for transitional housing, that if that was converted to more permanent nature, 
would be incredibly effective for places where housing might be a little bit tricky to identify. Um, so, there's, so there's that particular side. The second though, um, and maybe this isn't exactly what you were going, I don't think I've got the like the franchise muscle in me. Like that is not, that's not a skill set that I want to have or something that as the director currently at a tiny home for good, I'm going to pursue. Who knows, maybe the next person who takes this role will try and put it in New Rochelle and try and put it in Bronx or whatever. But um, for right now, we're just trying to do as best as we can in Syracuse. And uh, I think I'm the right person to do that there. If we take this thing wherever, like I don't think I'm that guy. But. Cool, awesome, thank you. Thanks guys. Thank you.